So, first of all, my presentation today is about Genghis Khan. So, what do you guys know about this guy? Killed a lot of people. Okay. Kind of a manual. <laughs> How so? What? Uh, raped a lot of women. Yes. Mongolia. Invaded northern China for the Okay, warlord, horrible person. He had great military mind. Was his army more cav cavalry based? Was that what it was? Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, uh, do, what do you know about the actual person, Genghis Khan? He was ruthless. Okay. <laughs> Temujin? Is not Genghis Khan. It's like Temujin or something? Yeah, Temujin. Genghis Khan actually means great Khan. And Khan is another word. It's a Mongolian term for a king or a warlord. So, I'm going to teach you a little bit about how he got his start, his uh, original life, because it's a quite interesting story. And uh, we start out in Mongolia, obviously, the original birthplace of Genghis Khan, Temujin. And I'll put his name up here too, so you can hear that. Because I'm probably going to call him Temujin for most of the time. Because there's all, all these other Khans around at the same time. I don't want to cause confusion. Uh, but, okay, so first of all, he's born into a, a noble family. His father is a Khan in Mongolia. He, he has his own tribe. They are a type of warlords and stuff. And uh, he is not actually the first son of his father. His father had a wife before him and before his mother, and his, he had sons with this wife as well. But basically what happens was when Genghis Khan was nine years old, he, uh, his father was killed by a rival faction. They used poison. And so they went back to their tribe because they were on a journey. They went back to the tribe, and the tribe found out, and they're like, yeah, we're not going to be ruled by some nine-year-old kid, which is understandable in a way because what would he know about ruling a tribe? Uh, <laughs> so basically, the tribe kicked him and all of his family members out, including the, the not legitimate family members that he's like half-brothers and stuff. So his half-brothers, him, his real brothers, his sisters, his mother, they're all kicked out. They're all living basically by themselves, and they're living in poverty. They're their only source of, they don't have any, I mean, there's no money in Mongolia, so there's no source of income, but their only source of uh, supplies is what Temujin and his brothers can hunt in the wilderness of Mongolia. So it, it's kind of a, it's a very, very harsh life. And Mongolia itself is a very, very harsh place. There's harsh winters, it's hot summers, there's part of it's a desert, so it's not the most welcoming environment. So he gets assistance, though, when he's in this dark time, and his friend Jamuka, I'll also put up here because he's very important. Jamuka is, his family is also uh, a royal family in Mongolia. They are descendant of Khans. He's a, he's a son of a Khan. He's about the same age as Temujin, though. So they become close friends when he's staying with his family. And later in life, Jamuka and his tribe help take, you know, a couple of years have passed. I think Temujin is about 20, 21 at this time. And he decides, okay, I want my tribe back. So Jamuka and his tribe help bring him back to his, his original tribe, the one he was born into, the one he was supposed to be the Khan of. And he takes them into there, and they basically surrender right away because they don't, they don't want to fight with Jamuka is a very, very powerful con at this time. So he gets him back his seat of power, and all these different things happen, but they end up fighting together for a long time against other warlords. There's this whole ordeal where Genghis Khan's wife gets kidnapped by a rival tribe, and they go, and it takes them a while to raise the amount of troops because it's a very, very powerful tribe, but they end up going, they rescue her, and that causes a lot of problems as well because she was raped, and she had a kid from that rape, and it was the firstborn son. So there's a lot of just, you know, 
hatred for that kid, but Timujin accepted him as his normal kid, and he raised him like it was his own. So I thought that was kind of interesting, because we all think of Genghis Khan as this horrible, horrible person, but he has a soft side. Uh, so Timujin and Jamuka are fighting together for years and years, and they're both building up their armies, and Timujin, uh, he's, he is kind of a young riser, and Jamuka starts to get jealous of this. So he starts trying to get more and more tribes, and the strategy Jamuka uses is he goes to get the nobles. So all he tries to appeal to the nobles of Mongolia and say, okay, you'll make a ton of more money if you join me, you'll, you'll be more powerful, I'll give you all these lands, and uh, I'll help you out when we conquer other people. So all the nobles are flocking to Jamuka. So what do you guys think Genghis Khan, Timujin, did in this situation to get more troops than Jamuka? Undermine them, took back his troops. Just Not quite. Conquered them, bull rush. <laughs> okay, well, so he's going for after, the, after the rich people. So Timujin, oh, he went to the peasants. Yeah, he goes after the peasants. And there's a couple of downsides to this, but uh, Timujin goes after the peasants, and they rally to him because he's very good to his bottom soldiers. The bottom rung of his soldiers, he gives them spoils of war, because obviously when you attack somebody, you basically rob them when you defeat them. So he, was, he gave a lot of the, the things that they robbed to the lower soldiers as well as the nobles. So throughout his ranks, everybody really liked him. So he does this, but the downside to this is that the peasants are not as well-trained fighters as the nobles. So uh, he gets defeated a couple times because eventually they do have their actual falling out and Jamuka attacks him and they fight and stuff. And Timujin gets defeated a couple times. He actually gets captured once and escapes. And he, but the, uh, the great thing about appealing to the peasants is that there's always more of them, right? You go, you, there's peasants everywhere, so you just raise another army. So he gets defeated a couple times and they just raise another army and another army. And eventually, they, they whittle down Jamuka's army and they defeat him, this very important battle. And uh, afterwards, Jamuka escapes. What, what happens is that by this time, all the Mongolians are either united under Timujin or Jamuka. So Timujin beats him, so all the, the Mongolians on Jamuka's side are like, all right, what do we do now? I mean, we're, we, don't, we don't want to be on the losing side, right? So they basically turn in Jabuka to Timujin, and they say like, okay, we caught your, your old best friend who betrayed you and stuff. And Timujin does an interesting thing here. He actually has the people who betrayed Jamuka executed because he believes that they're traitors and you can't trust them. They're just worthless pieces of, you know. <laughs> and uh, so Timujin has them killed. And he talks to Jamuka and he says, all right, I know we've had our falling outs and we've had our troubles, but I'd like you to come back into my army and you know, help me out while I try to conquer the world, basically. And ironically, he declines and he says that just like there can only be one sun in the sky, there can only be one great Khan. So Timujin has him ritually, ritualistically killed, which uh, he actually chose the method as well because Mongols had a fascination with a bloodless death because if, if you died a bloody death, you know, it, you, it's, you know, a, it's outwardly a violent death. You know, you get your throat cut open. <coughs> but the bloodless <coughs> death, ironically, I, I see it as more violent. He basically had his back broken by like taking like two soldiers and like just taking his back in. Very violent, but it's the Mongol way, I guess. So, uh, a couple questions for you guys. Do you find it ironic that Timujin was viewed as a more compassionate leader in Mongolia? And, you know, considering what we know about him and what he did afterwards to all these other different nations that he just completely annihilated? It's very surprising. Well, I'd say, I mean, I'm surprised that they think that because I've only heard the information that I've heard, but considering they have the inside history and all we've heard is that Genghis Khan came to China and slaughtered millions of people. That's the only mindset that we as outsiders are going to get rather than the Mongolians who actually know the stories and how think, compassionate he may have been. Do you think it might have been partly because Mongolians have a different culture as us though? I mean, Mongolian culture at the time is very, very rough. So 
maybe it was just the culture of Mongolians saying, oh, we don't think this guy is that violent for us, but to all other cultures, he seems very, very uh, ruthless and brutal. Absolutely. I'm really surprised about the child, too, that he took in that, raised that child. Yeah, yeah. I'm born. shocked that he would do that. I would think he would just kill him. Yeah. That's what they yeah. usually did for bastard kids. Uh, and another question. Do you guys think his experience with poverty and failure during his campaign to unite the, the Mongol tribes, do you think that contributed to his ruthlessness or it made him hold back maybe in a couple of situations? I think it made him more successful because he wasn't afraid to fail. And yeah. he probably put that mentality into his army. It's like, don't be afraid to fail. You can do this. I mean, yeah, and the fact that he uh, chose the peasants over the nobles. Yeah, he knows that they're, they're like obviously hard workers. Like he had to go out and hunt with his brothers to feed his mother and the rest of the family and stuff. Like he knows what kind of people he's getting. He knows the hardships that those peasants have to go through just like he did. Yeah. So he yeah. brought them on his, who wouldn't want them on their army? Yeah, and I mean, another thing is that that might have made him more appealing to the peasants. They might be saying, oh, Jamuka, he's been, you know, living a lofty life in, like since he was born. This guy can go kill bears in the woods just to Family. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, to my for my closing thoughts, I thought this was uh, I thought it was interesting that Timujin lived his own kind of version of the American dream in <laughs> Mongolia before, like five hundred years before America was invented. And it's very it's obviously a very different version because he's he's slaughtering people and stuff, but still like starting from nothing and then ending up on on the top of the world. I thought it was interesting. And, I found uh, one historian who said that Timujin's rise to power was similar to when, if a, an American slave during the Civil War were to rise to power and conquer all the land from Canada to Brazil. So, I mean, 